Hey folks, it's Rena Jadav here, host of the Healthier Podcast, founder of HealCircle.org. Dr. Cynthia, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Now you're here today because you've written a fantastic new book called Brave New Medicine. And we're gonna do this as a book masterclass where you're gonna walk us through the different sections. But before we dive in, Dr. Cynthia, tell us a little bit about why did you write the book? I wrote the book in order to heal. That was my, my real impetus. It began as a journal. I've kept a journal since I was in middle school. Um, so uh, I never intended to write a book, much less publish it. But um, I am a trained internist. Internal medicine doctors are experts in chronic diseases. And it wasn't until I developed uh, health challenges that I realized how absolutely little I knew about health and disease. Um, so the, the journal originally had started out as my uh, mental notes and, and emotional notes on um, what I was experiencing and uh, how I could begin to make sense of it in order to empower myself to get out of the pit of despair I was in. I had been at my worst, I had been uh, bed bound for six months, housebound for two years, and then largely housebound for several years after that. I loved how intimate this book is when you read it. It tells such a personal story. And you know, the, the tagline of the book, right? A doctor's unconventional path to healing her autoimmune illness. It really captures the essence of what I think we as society are having to face today as a challenge, which is I end up with symptoms. I go to the doctor and doctors can't figure it out. And now I feel alone and I have to figure mm -hmm. this out. And you've written a book that I think should yeah. be read by anyone out there who's suffering from any kind of a symptom whatsoever as a way to understand that there are answers out there. And that just because a conventional treatment or a plan is not available doesn't mean that there is no hope because I see a lot of hopelessness out there. Mm -hmm. A lot of hopelessness mm -hmm. and hopelessness. And I think your yes. book is so inspiring. So yeah, uh, and I, had, I had been in both of those um, states for quite a long time myself. It was not uh, enlightenment. It was not assertiveness that got me out of the hole. It was really desperation. So uh, nothing opens your mind like desperation. And I had, um, uh, basically my story was after the birth of my first child, I developed autoimmune thyroid condition, um, which is, you know, a lot of people have heard the term Hashimoto's and it's much more common. And most of the time with Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune thyroid condition, people present in underactive uh, thyroid states, and it is generally chronic and progressive, at least in the conventional model that we're taught. Um, the postpartum form, which is what I had, um, generally resolves. So I, um, I went through the overactive, the underactive roller coaster of, of thyroid um, disease, and after a year, my numbers normalized. So I had been trained to think, and to approach um, and diagnose and follow up diseases in a particular way, which, um, which is defined by uh, a set of criteria. I no longer follow, fit into that set of criteria because my numbers normalized, my blood levels normalized, but my symptoms remained. I was sleepless, I was exhausted, my hair was falling out, I couldn't put on weight, um, to say nothing of my moods being all over the place. And I was a new mother. So I sort of, you know, I did what a lot of people do. I uh, diminished my symptoms, I dismissed them, and I was just trying to push through it, don't complain. And um, by the criteria, I was cured. So uh, I was living a functional life still, a very full life. and. Um, with a job that I loved, married to the love of my life. And so I wasn't complaining. Um, then there was a very pivotal trip to Beijing that I took with my family and um, a very dramatic episode where I lost consciousness and came to in an emergency room in downtown Beijing. And when I woke from that, I was basically in a body that 
was completely foreign to me. Um, I could not really move my limbs. I was in such profound exhaustion. I was worried I couldn't catch my next breath. And then I was in chronic vertigo. So at the time, I thought it was, again, something acute, um, that I had a gastroenteritis um, and I was probably dehydrated. Uh, the other twist to the story or surprise to the story was that I was newly pregnant with my second child. And so the hormonal fluctuations, I was eating a lot of um, foreign food proteins that I wasn't you know, accustomed to. There was a lot of pollution. So I was kind of just um, making sense of it and thinking, okay, you know, I just got to let it pass. I was young. I was still in my 30s. And yet that would be the beginning of the, really the rest of my life. Um, and uh, I would stay in that state for, yeah, for a few years before I, um, I had to begin asking new questions. Incredible. And so many of us can relate with you because we've been there. We've all experienced these onset of symptoms that we try to explain away or that we diminish and we, we sort of talk ourselves out of being concerned, especially when you go to your doctor and your doctor says, don't worry about it, you're totally fine. Like, what do you expect? You just had a baby. Right. Of course, you're going to be experiencing fatigue and tiredness and emotions. And so we tend to ignore them. And there's such an important message that your book gives, which is don't ignore your symptoms. There's a reason that they were there. They're telling you something, mm -hmm. pay attention so you don't end up with a much more severe crisis down the road. All right, well, let's dive into prologue. You, you call it the difficult patient. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that section. So that was um, a talk. I was giving a grand rounds presentation at a major medical center. And uh, it, was a, it was a scary moment for me because I was still, I was um, out of the, complete housebound phase, but I was still quite brittle in terms of managing my symptoms. I mean, I was having vertigo just before the talk. Um, but the other piece that was, um, took some courage on, on my part was that doctors generally, we don't talk about um, our personal health problems unless we've, be, we've conquered it fully and sort of become the expert. And I had been invited to give a talk on integrative and functional medicine on this new paradigm, <clears throat> which I had been practicing for a few years at that point, or several years by that point, and um, which I was completely happy to do. But what I ended up doing was I thought, you know what, this is not about this school of thought versus that school of thought. You know, we can we can get political about anything, including health, you know, healthcare and different paradigms of medicine. So it was really like, how can I do this in a way that does not feel like I'm preaching to them? And I kind of got this pit in my stomach when I was preparing the talk, because I'd given lots of medical talks, but I realized, oh God, you know, I gotta, I gotta share my story. Um, I began the talk by saying that um, I, you know, how did I end up from conventional mainstream medicine into, uh, the paradigm that I was practicing in now, and like most things in healthcare, it was a patient that began this journey. So I presented um, a patient case, um, and where you know this patient just kept coming back, kept coming back, kept coming back, and we we call these patients difficult patients. Um, they're recognized by sort of repeated visits, normal labs, sort of demanding additional testing, um, sometimes becoming, yeah, just like anxious and kind of depressed in your face, right? So, and you know, the challenge is that in a 15 minute appointment, doctors are under tremendous pressure to come up with a simple solution, right? I mean, that's just the way it's set up. So it's sort of set up to pit patients against doctor if there's not a simple, straightforward solution. And, um, and I remember the moment when I myself saw in the eyes of my doctors, oh my God, I saw it reflected back to me. I've become that difficult patient. And um, so at this, uh, at this Grand Rounds presentation, I was presenting my case and I sort of did a show of hands, right? Like how many of you would 
would refer this patient to the psychiatrist, you know, a bunch of hands. And I said, well, you know, I did. And, you know, the psychiatrist said, nope, you know, there's, there's nothing psychiatric going on with her. All right, how many of you would, you know, try this or try that? How many of you would sever this relationship, you know, and refer to one of your colleagues? And at that moment, I felt like I was connecting with my colleagues because everybody has, has had that experience. And, um, you know, and then I said, well, there was one problem, you know, that patient was actually me. And so at that point, it was just like, it was dead silent. My husband had actually come, he's not a doctor. He had come to, uh, to give me moral support. And he said, oh my God, I just, you could just hear the heart sort of, you know, thumping in that, in that audience. And, um, you know, and again, I wasn't even doing that to sort of, you know, to, to catch them and to stump them and to make them feel, oh my God, trapped. It was that I had, that's really where I had come to myself. And um, that there was this element of self, um, yeah, I was berating myself and, and maybe an, even an element of self-loathing. So um, when I began my journey uh, of writing, about it. I did. I started seeing the parallel, like some parallels, like, whoa, autoimmunity, self-attacking self, you know, like there was a pattern where when I didn't fit the paradigm, my first reaction was to berate myself. It wasn't to question the paradigm. So um, that is a, that is a, a mental um, habit that I have really, really worked hard to, <laughs> to release, mm -hmm. is to honor what my experiences are mm -hmm. and to hold them you know, as truth. Mm -hmm. And if it, the paradigm doesn't fit, how do we, how do we broaden our um, definitions and our ideas beyond what limits us? The other piece is that, um, you know, what, what I came to realize was in myself was, okay, so I'm within the range of thyroid um, tests, but what if, let's say I'm at one end of the range. What if for me, my optimal range is at the lower, at the other end of the range? So um, the individual uh, variations also come into play. And so we need to begin to um, correlate. And this is something, what I had learned in medical school from my best faculty uh, was always clinical correlation. You know, you have to correlate it with what's going on with the patient. So, um, you know, again, in this 15 minute model, we've, we've lost that capacity. And we haven't been given a lot of tools because we haven't been, you know, my, my medical training was uh, about four hours total of nutrition. And it was extremes of nutrition, right? What happens when you're toxic with vitamin A? What happens when you're right. you know, completely starved of protein? Like just stuff that we're not really seeing in, in our day-to-day -day lives. And so uh, I, also as a doctor, I was very limited in terms of tools. So even if I said to a patient, okay, maybe your level, this, this level is not ideal for you. Um, I didn't know what to do with it. Right. The, so one problem is the, about the range, right? And sort of how do we get, how do we know what is an optimal range for, uh, for you and to say nothing of um, the majority of the population. The other piece is that the tests themselves don't go deep enough. And again, we have to, because of the way our healthcare model is arranged, testing screening tests have to be cost effective right if we're just kind of doing all sorts of screening tests on everybody and anybody who comes in with fatigue uh we're going to be more broke than we already are so um the amount of testing that we have doesn't go deep enough so the first piece is just to recognize those two elements and then to say sort of well what can we do about it a lot of what uh, people are feeling in terms of unwellness. Most of what comes into the primary care office, chronic pain, you know, and it could be anything from severe, severe chronic back pain to fibromyalgia, kind of generalized, you know, muscle soreness or aches, um, migraines to um, fatigue 
and dizziness. Like these are kind of the, the um, symptoms that tend to affect so much of the population, but we don't have a lot to do in terms of that if we can't diagnose a disease. Um, and so what was pivotal for me was at my crash, right? I'm sort of at my low, low, my marriage was about to fall apart. And I thought, if I don't try differently, I'm going to lose my family. So I started, I went back to pathology 101. I didn't suddenly break open into alternative, uh, you know, healing modalities. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to go back to basics. I read my pathology textbook. And this was this was 20 years ago that I was in medical school and the book was published even before that. So even then, I remember opening to chapter one and it was saying the one cause, one disease model no longer pertains. Mm. And somewhere I, I had just forgotten that through the training, right? It said that we have to start looking at uh, microorganisms, right? Pathogen, uh, uh, disease-causing germs. Wow. We have to look at uh, toxins in the environment, and this is how diseases happen. You know, UV radiation, um, stress, and it. And there was even one part that was um, quite philosophical. It said that living to be alive is a risk. You know, because it's we're we're constantly being exposed to um, elements that challenge us. And so if we don't understand how to keep ourselves healthy, we're gonna just be, uh, th that cumulative load is then going to whittle us into chronic disease. And so that was a huge revelation for me because it reminded me that the common denominator for all chronic disease was inflammation. Mm -hmm. Was inflammation at a point where the capacity for the body to repair cells and, and damage in the DNA um, was, uh, could not keep up with the amount of damage. And so that was an aha moment. I thought, oh, all of these symptoms that I have, even the dizziness, even this extreme fatigue, all of these things are signs of inflammation. So instead of having a diagnosable disease, even though I fit the criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome and something called dysautonomia, where the autonomic nervous system that controls vital bodily functions like uh, blood pressure, heart rate, digestion, body temperature was in complete disarray. I could, um, if I went down to the basic unit of how do cells repair and how do we, uh, uh, how do our bodies um, decrease inflammation, then it gave me something tangible to work with. Mm. And so, you know, as my stepwise journey, I was basically doing a journey into integrative and functional medicine, functional medicine being, right, going to the root causes of disease, generally in five classes, right, allergens, poor diet, toxins, um, infections, and um, stress. So uh, how, how there's a workable paradigm in that. I mean, once I finally came to uh, functional medicine as a paradigm that had been developed and taught to hundreds of doctors, I was like, whoa, I don't have to make this up. I can apply this to patients in the clinical setting. And so that was a very exciting moment for me to get to that point. Something really important you just said, the cumulative toxic load. And that was a huge aha moment for me as well. Now, there's a phrase for it. What is it? What's the word? The, the word in physiology terms is uh, called allostatic load. And most people have heard of homeostasis, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a thermostat, right? So we have a set point and we're always trying to, in terms of health, trying to get back to that set point. The difference with allostasis versus homeostasis is that allostasis works with much more complex systems. So we're actually, when we say homeostasis in terms of health, we really mean most of the time allostasis, that, that set point. Allostasis is like, for example, um, if we're exercising, our set point, our ideal set point is gonna be different than if we're at rest. So it moves, it adjusts to, um, the dynamic state that is currently 
being experienced. So when, when I talk about allostatic load, it is this sort of, um, one way to look at it is sort of this, uh, this snowball effect or, or like this, uh, this mountain. And at a certain threshold, we will begin to experience symptoms. And then at a higher threshold, we will actually begin to have a diagnosable disease. So usually what happens is we have, um, we have sort of mounting stresses, right? So the five causes of disease I was just talking about, they sort of mount our body has a capacity to, um, to meet them. And then let's say the stress, let's say it's an infection, you know, you get the flu and then things kind of calm back down, right? Or actually you, you go up, right? You actually have the flu, you have symptoms and then your body can deal with it, you heal and then it goes back to baseline. What happens with chronic disease and chronic inflammation is that baseline continues to rise, rise, rise. And then um, it's much, the, the, the amount of stress that you need to hit the symptom mark is going to be much less. And so unless we can bring that baseline down, you know, it, you know some people know, they go, oh my God, you know, I got a little bit of uh, an emotional stress and I was in bed. I was just completely knocked out. Um, or, you know, I had a... a wisdom tooth removed and I was, oh my God, I was sick after that for, you know, two weeks. Well, we know that those people are um, in a state of very, very delicate allostatic balance. And um, so in functional medicine, what I really do with my patients is how, what allostatic factors can we identify in terms of stress and how do we lower them? So the more that we lower, the more um, resilient they become. Mm. And I have to say, it's really satisfying to um, eliminate infections, particularly like stealth infections, right? Like chronic Lyme or hidden parasites that have been in the gut for, you know. A root canal decades. infection. Exactly, exactly. Dental caries. Um, even, you know, gingival disease that people didn't know they had, um, or an allergen, right? Like for me, gluten was a constant trigger and I didn't know that. I didn't know that gluten was related to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I didn't know that it was related to gut inflammation. So really reducing, um, individual factors, the biggest ones tend to be emotional and I mean, what I would call sort of spiritual, something that, you know, each person can only, we can only do for ourselves. And that's actually the base um, of my health pyramid, where I say the first most important, the biggest bang for your buck is just calming yourself down. And if you can get yeah. to calm, yes. then a lot of the other pieces will start to fall into place and make your life easier. Um, let's dive into kind of section one. Mm -hmm. um, talk just a little bit about what is it that you've shared in, in part one? So part one, I mean, my book is divided into uh, part one, part two, um, and then a third part, which is um, more the how-to section. And parts one and two are my memoir. So what I really wanted to um, show was, God, what does it look like, first of all, to have a mystery condition, uh, not just with doctors and, and uh, medical providers, but um, you know, with your partner, with your kids. I mean, what does it look like? How do we continue to manage our lives when uh, there's so much inner turmoil going on, when your inner workings are not behaving the way that you would like for them to behave. Um, and I say that um, sarcastically. So uh, the um, part one is really, yeah, the, the fall, the sequential fall and decline of my health. Um, and at the same time, was the crumbling of the medical paradigm that I had trained in. So by the end of part one, it's I'm at my low. And um, being at the low, you know, that saying where you uh, break down and at some point you break open. I broke open just at the end of part one into 
recognizing the need to try differently. So in part two, I think you share your own experience in terms of what exactly happened. So give our listeners and our viewers a little insight into your own experience in terms of your health issues and symptoms. And then, of course, we're going to dive into how you healed. Yeah. So, well, part two is the healing journey. And, um, you know, so the first step was really going to pathology 101 basics, having that aha moment about inflammation. And the very first thing I did was I knew I had to get my sleep better because if I couldn't get my sleep better, I was not going to have any energy to do anything else. Um, so I really dove into the science of uh, circadian rhythms. And I had known about melatonin and the pineal gland and the hypothalamus, that those two glands sort of regulating this clock in relation to jet lag. I mean, it was, it was a very, very basic knowledge that I had. I did not know that every organ uh, in the body had its own uh, circadian rhythm. And I mean, of course it does, right? I mean, if, um, I think the, the basic amnesia that I had um, was that, you know, like even though my mind and my spirit could, were, were boundless and I could do anything, that my body was still uh, bound by laws of nature. Mm -hmm. And that if I didn't have a body, I was not going to have a mind or a spirit either. So I better learn how to uh, connect with myself. And the first piece was, um, was the circadian rhythm. So um, one of the things I just did, it was very simple, but just I started regulating my schedule a little bit so that, um, that an irregular schedule was not another stress in the allostatic load. Um, like for example, this is a very um, basic example, but like, you know, we often, all of us know, if we skip a meal, our stomach starts growling or our intestines start, you know, rumbling. And well, what is that? That is the, that's the circadian rhythm of the digestive tract turning on because it is prepping for a meal. So that takes energy. You know, and then we don't eat, like, let's say I don't eat a lunch at noon like I usually do. I'm skipping it that day or I'm kind of just involved in other things. I don't have time to eat. And then, it, and then suddenly my digestion then shuts down, right? After revving up, it's like starting an engine, right? And revving up and then suddenly it quiets down because there's no food. Whoops, false signal. And then I decide to eat at two o'clock. It had, well, wait a minute. Oh, we got to rev back up. So it's this, um, it's very out of sync. And, um, and, and that's just me, you know, relating to me to say nothing of my body um, cycling with the cycles of light and dark, um, you know, with those around me. So uh, that was the first step. And, um, you know, another piece uh, after that was that um, if I could not get my vertigo improved, I was not going to be able to do a lot of research um, to say nothing of being able to just interact with my children who were very young at that time. And uh, I couldn't read very long because of the vertigo. So um, that was when I broke out into uh, trying acupuncture. And it was not without a lot of skepticism. Um, and, you know, one of the things I also realized sort of in hindsight in my journey was how much energy skepticism takes. So I was using a lot of energy being skeptical. Yes, what a waste of time, isn't it, in hindsight? <laughs> you know, the skepticism came from fear. And I mean, you know, I, I was so vulnerable yeah. that it seemed, I mean, I didn't, you know, berate myself for being um, skeptical, but I was like, oh, that seemed, you know, yeah, that made sense because I was so vulnerable. But there's a difference between being analytical and being skeptical. So, um, but that said, I tried acupuncture um, because a friend had strongly recommended it and it was low risk. So my approach from that point on as a doctor patient was, mm -hmm. what can I do that's low risk, that's high potential gain? So that, that, that was kind of my right. Lane. And so that's really how I approached the rest of my healing. And the acupuncturist was incredible. Um, Dr. Bob Levine, and not only did he 
uh, you know, help my system. I mean, I had massive withdrawals um, after treatments with like two needles. But the other thing was that he really taught me how to understand the body in terms of systems. Yes. Um, you know, which is the Chinese medicine model, but it's also the functional medicine model. So, oh, when my thyroid was flaring up, it wasn't just a thyroid problem. It was a hormone system problem. My adrenals, my hypothalamus, my pituitary, they weren't communicating well. And they are linked to the digestive system, you know, which was inflamed and which is in turn linked to my nervous system. And, you know, so all the systems in the body are linked. And it's that was one body. We really forget. It's it, one body, one mind. I mean, everything is yes. connected and we're connected yes. with the environment. We're connected to other people. So, um, yeah, we really have this sense. Um, and I remember after finishing uh, residency, I had this sense that we were very autonomous um, individuals. And even the barriers, right, the, the primary barriers, the, the gut and the skin uh, and the respiratory system, I just had this sense like, oh, you know what? We're semi-permeable, but we only allow in things that, that we want to allow in, right? Like we have these transporters or sometimes they diffuse across um, cell membranes, but oh, but it's sort of what, you know, what is meant to be absorbed. And I just did not know, I had no clue how permeable we were to, uh, you know, artificial chemicals and um, parasites and other infections if our barriers were not uh, intact. The uh, acupuncturist told me that when he was feeling my pulses in different areas, I was so out of sync with myself that if he had been blinded, he would have thought I was three different people. Wow. So, um, yeah, and I had, I had seen him uh, for two or three years and um but he got me to the point where i could begin to read and begin to research on my own which was a really really big deal when did the vertigo uh mm -hmm. go away i have a friend who's got severe vertigo okay yeah i'm just curious yeah so it um it really improved after healing my gut um which involved removing gluten so that was a big piece of it Mm. Uh, I was still continuing the acupuncture at the time. Okay. Um, the other piece was uh, when I saw, this actually was not in my book, but was um, when I saw a cranial osteopath who was actually just talking about like some of my cranial bones being a little bit off and affecting my middle ear, which, you know, I, I didn't even know these kinds of things. I, I didn't even know they existed, much less... That right. you could do anything about it. Contributed to one of my issues, right? Like, exactly. how did I miss exactly. this? This is exactly. so important. Yes, yes. So um, there's just a tremendous amount to learn about um, the body. Oh, and the, the other really big piece um, for the vertigo and for actually overall health and vitality was um, starting a Qigong practice. So I had begun uh, at the... Uh, suggestion of my acupuncturist and qigong for those who don't know is a moving meditation and it's uh you know it, it looks like a bunch of you know slow movements that are really easy to do and a little bit boring but it is a mind body spirit practice and the consciousness piece of it is huge so in the beginning i was doing the practices uh, very minimally, about 15, maybe 30 minutes a day. Um, and that was kind of all I could do. I didn't have a lot of energy. I also didn't have a lot of faith in it. It was just, you know, it, it was like another thing I had to do on top of everything else I was doing for my health and managing my children and the household. So it felt like another sort of chore. However, I started noticing, so you were asking about symptoms, uh, in addition to fatigue, vertigo, um, and insomnia, which were the big ones, I was having a lot of what I call accessory symptoms. I was having mm -hmm. things like frequent urination, particularly mm -hmm. at night. You know, I, I, I knew I stopped drinking fluids after dinner, but I would have to get up and pee, you know, four or five times a night. 
And people told me things like, well, you know, you had two kids and maybe your, your bladder just sort of is, you know, out of, out of whack and this is just the way things are going to be. As soon as I started uh, practicing Qigong, which of course I realized was rewiring my neurons and right. also, also changing my gene expression, right, from inflammatory to non-inflammatory, um, I stopped having to pee at night. So uh, I also stopped having um, myalgias in my shoulders, which I didn't even know I had until they were gone. Um, so there, these accessory symptoms began to disappear. And I had just, you know, I think like most people, uh, learn to just endure them as this is just the new normal. So that was a very big um, turning point for me to continue my practice of Qigong. And I upped it to 45 minutes a day. Over, I would say, six to nine months, my vertigo improved to where I could close my eyes um, and stand with my feet together and not fall over. And that, that was a really big um, wow. uh, milestone for me. Wow. So, but I was still doing it transactionally. You know, like I'm gonna do this in order to feel better. Um, after several years of practicing, I had another health crisis, sort of right at the time when this book was being finished. And I had no choice at that point but to go deeper into my Qigong practice. You know, I had, I had exhausted every other option. So um, I upped my practice to two, three hours a day. And that's when I dropped deeper into the consciousness piece of it. And I started practicing because it was like eating and sleeping, like I needed it rather than doing it in order to receive something back. And uh, I have to say that's when I sort of had a radical remission um, at that level. I guess, of, I guess we would call it energy work, you know, sort of at the level yes. of that kind of depth. The spirit, the soul starts to get healed at that point. Yes. And yes. you can then start to completely let go. Um, you talk about how people like us who have an autoimmune crisis start to define ourselves by our illness. Yes. And how one of the hardest things actually to do is to, after suffering for years, is to learn to disassociate yourself. Mm -hmm. Just shed a little bit about that because I think where a lot of people get 80% better and then are stuck with the 20% is because yes. of that one thing. They just don't know how to decouple themselves with the symptoms that they've lived with for so, so long. Talk a little bit about how you pull that off. Yeah, so it was, um, part of it was the writing, was um, getting outside of myself, you know, writing from my husband's perspective, writing from, you know, what, what were my kids doing when I was, you know, right in my cave suffering. Oh, there were parents, you know, in-laws, community around me. I began, and, and then also writing about myself, even though I was writing in first person, I was thinking about myself in third person. And, uh, and I began to realize how much I had identified with chronic illness. The writing, I began to then identify with being a writer. Like, oh, okay, I'm a writer now. And, you know, through the Qigong practice, I realized, whoa, like, I don't need to identify with any of those things. I am just who I am, you know, without being labeled, am I a patient? Am I a doctor? Am I a mother? Am I a wife? Am I a writer? And um, there was tremendous freedom in that. But it is very insidious. And it's not just uh, patients who, uh, it's not just a patient problem. When we diagnose patients, and actually even when we do testing, you know, with very good intentions, each time we are reinforcing that they're not well. Right, so, oh, I'm gonna do more food allergy testing. Oh, I'm gonna do more thyroid testing. I'm gonna do testing of your gut. I'm gonna do testing of your uh, blood cells. And each time we're reinforcing that message. So it, it becomes um, an invisible factor in the allostatic load. And it keeps us in that place of um, helplessness, even if we don't feel helpless. 
Um, but it's incredibly important, yeah, to begin with seeing yourself, you know, and some of my patients that I can see it and I say, you know what, just um, start, you know, next time you take a shower, just stand in front of the mirror, you know, close off and just stare at yourself. Just look at yourself, you know, take your name away, take any labels away, take your story away and just be with yourself. And um, so there's a lot of different ways to reconnect with, ah, you know, I'm actually bigger than my disease. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it has, to, it has to be a shift in awareness that the person, him or herself, uh, takes on. Absolutely. So in the final section, um, you've got a fantastic checklist, which is 15 items, and I'm going to rattle each one and give us kind of the key insight and recommendation. And this is sort of how you help your patients. So the first one, you say how to get off the couch, aka how to heal. I love it. Very cute. Um, the first one is ask new questions. How, if I'm a patient of yours, what questions do you want me to ask? Well, I usually encourage people, like, instead of asking, like, looking outwardly for expectations, it's more of an going inward. Mm -hmm. um, relate to yourself in a different way. Um, and, um, you know, and we, we tend to recycle the same questions over and over again. So just ask a different question. You know, instead of saying, like, what's the matter with me, just ask, well, what, what matters? You know, that's something that uh, Wayne Jonas, who is an integrative doc, um, really advocates in the exam room with working with patients. What matters to me? And start shifting these um, fundamental questions about our lives. And just shifting the question is going to shift uh, the way that your brain rewires and that the way that your cells are relating because we have new thoughts all of a sudden. And we know through the science, right, through neuroscience, through epigenetic science, that that's actually what happens. I literally went and reprogrammed. I did this chant with Sadhguru, which is, I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not the body, I'm not the mind. And physically, literally disassociated myself from my 28 symptoms so I could keep it at a distance. I could, I could look at myself mm. objectively and not become the diseased person, but really be this whole person who in a moment in time was experiencing then and that it was going to be gone very, very quickly. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And another example would be, um, you know, if symptoms are overwhelming, right? Instead of, yeah, like what's wrong with me and what's causing it or whatever, but just really asking a, a, a gentler, more compassionate question, like what is my body trying to tell me? Yes. Right? So yes. What do I need to tune into yes. in myself? So it becomes an exercise in self-compassion um, yeah, rather than um, sort of a desperate plea uh, with, you know, with answers that are often very, very far off. And I think a lot of us, if we dig deeper when we are sick, a lot of it turns around into the silent blame, like my body's letting me down. Like, why are you letting me down? Like, there's almost this anger. Yes. You know, what's wrong with you? Yes. What, what, why are you doing this to me? Yes. And that in itself is such a negative emotion to carry mm -hmm. instead of, to your point, turning it around and saying, what are you saying to me? Because I've clearly done something to you and you're trying to speak to me and I need to really listen to you more carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, reset your inner clock. Oh my God, do we all need to reset our inner clock? Give us some ideas how, and you've got some great tips. So that's, that's what I was alluding to earlier about the circadian rhythm. Right. So, I mean, really, it's just um, it's setting. A, I mean, in the beginning, it's just it's as simple as setting a schedule. Um, and anybody who's had kids, I mean, we just we know they do better <laughs> on a schedule. Um, my dog does better on a schedule. So um, it's really as simple as that. And, you know, part of that also uh, getting the sleep cycle um more routine is uh yeah you know what winding down you know after dusk sort of mimicking nature so turning the lights down you know i had gotten orange uh orange goggles and was wearing them around to so that the blue light would get filtered out and would help you know regulate my melatonin cycle um so there's a lot of things that you can do and you know and that actually became something one of the points later on down the list is about practicing pleasure 
mm-hmm. and how healing that is. And the orange goggles actually became, you know, sort of a, a point of pleasure because it would make my, my kids and my husband laugh. Um, because every time I would just I would put them on and I would look like a fruit fly, you know? <laughs> and, and so it just, okay, there's mom doing her weird thing. Um, so you can begin to even insert playfulness in there as well. The other thing you just said, you know, mom being weird, again, those of us who are moms, I, I heard that a lot. You know, there's mom being, making her crazy food. You know, there, there's mom being weird again. Again, I want to say this to everyone out there. Don't worry about the labels that you get assigned when you're on a healing journey because your goal is to heal. And if it means wearing orange glasses at 3 p.m., wear the orange glasses at 3 p.m. If it means being a party pooper, which is what I was for 18 months, I was a total party pooper. Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock, lights out. And that meant 9 o'clock, no television, no digital devices. And that meant mommy was an awful party pooper. Mm -hmm. Um, that, That I was okay with that because to me, I knew that there was an end in sight and that I had to get there. So Mm -hmm. here's two women who've been called weird by their kids and and survived. So sometimes you do have to, and I think this is one of the hardest things is, well, what are people gonna say around me? What am I, you know, am I I gonna put my family through too much hardship to get better? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I tell people is, well, put them through it because, or you may not be there. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna be fully healed and recovered and be there for your family, be, be very comfortable putting them through uh, some months of discomfort as you become whole again. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, next one. Give yourself permission to receive. Oh my God, this one's so hard for us women. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by this? Well, just, um, yeah, that notion of, um, you know, we have to take it on. We have to do it all. Um, and not just do it all. It's um, we have to do it all ourselves. And I think as any, anyone who's been in a caretaker role, uh, you know, and I would say as a doctor, mother, uh, and being a Chinese woman, <laughs> I, I sort of, I just got just, you know, indoctrinated with the sense of duty. There's nothing wrong with the duty, uh, but my first duty is going to always be to myself. Um, I have to take care of myself and I have to learn how to receive from other people. You know, BJ Miller, who's a doctor, um, author, speaker, he's a, an advocate for, um, for end of life care, uh, but he himself is a triple amputee, has been through considerable wow. amount of suffering. And one of the things he said was it, was, it just struck me as so fundamental. He said, look, you know what, um, people, you know, I, I used to, I used to, he said, I used to be very guilt, feel very guilty, like, oh, everyone was, you know, supporting me, and they were, you know, feeding me, and they were, uh, just doing all sorts of uh, daily, uh, you know, need for me. And then he said, you know, at some point I just realized I just need to get over myself. Like in life, sometimes we give and sometimes we receive. So the notion that, oh, I, I can't take anyone's support is also, is also an ego mind thing. You know, it's, it's like just, oh God, just get over yourself. That, and you can receive as well. Absolutely. Uh, but that, that's, a, that's a lifelong um, lesson for me. I mean, I'm still learning how to do that. Every day's a new day, as I say. It's a new day to learn. Exactly. All right. And it doesn't always apply to people either. Like, I, I'm learning how to receive and be open in nature. You know, just kind of exactly. fully, fully relaxing, taking the sun in. So. Which, is the, which is your next bullet, which is get a daily dose of nature. Oh, and yay. Walks in the sun, right? Breathe yeah. in deep. Walks in the sun. Yeah. Uh, number five, detoxify the house. What is the one thing that you think everybody needs to do now? Ooh, the one thing. Um, well, if you have a gas stove, always turn on your ventilation fan. And I would say the other big thing is um, flame retardants in uh, couches and furniture with foam. And so, you know, aside from throwing out your couch and replacing it with um flame retardant free furniture, um, regular vacuuming, because it, it settles in the dust. And that's one of the things that is very, very prevalent in terms of indoor air pollution. That was a really good tip. Mm-hmm. Uh, number six, let intuition tell your thinking mind where to look next. How did you develop your intuition? Because it's not something uh, many of us are blessed with. 
Right. Oh, and I'm, I was not blessed with it. But that, that step is a direct quote that I borrowed from um, Jonas Salk, who was one of the uh, inventors of the polio vaccine. So, you know, our forefathers in science actually led, a lot of them led with intuition in terms of discovery. And going back to question number one, or step number one about asking new questions, if you tap into your intuition, it really, really uh, opens you up to questions your rational mind might not ask, or it might take you into directions your rational mind would not go. Um, and so what I had learned, this was as I was embarking on integrative strategies and oh, understanding, you know, kind of learning about diets and learning about, um, you know, just all the different ways in which healing happens, I was overwhelmed. Um, I felt very lost. In so suddenly I went from having no tools to too many tools. And I didn't even know what those tools were, but I knew on the horizon was sort of infinity. And I learned from a friend who had been staying with us that intuition was something like art or music that could be developed, uh, which I did not know. And intuition also, that term has been really, really overused and misused. And we, we use it sometimes when we mean instinct and sometimes we say it when we mean rational. And so um, HeartMath, this institute based in Silicon Valley has a great uh, definition, which I like, which was the, uh, the processes that um, lie outside of the typical cognitive processes. Um, that are based in sensations in the mind and body that result in a certainty of knowing. So really what that means is kind of an experiential sense of knowing. And again, I mean, you know, short of being born with gifts of clairvoyance or clairaudience, I mean, I didn't know that this was something you could develop, but everybody can no matter where they are on the spectrum. So um, one of the things I had to learn was to actually listen to my body. And it was not just healing because I was learning intuition. I was tuning into my body and I was, be be I was beginning to discern what was a symptom of an imbalance that I needed to address versus what was a signal my body was picking up from the environment that my, my rational mind could not yet uh, you know, make sense of. So um, the other piece that I had learned, uh, you know, and I have these steps in the back of my book uh, about developing intuition was that instead of sort of, you know, meditating, oh, because one of the big pre prerequisites for intuition uh, developing is to silence the, the overused analytical mind. That's right. So, um, I had to learn how to do that. So a contemplative practice is the foundation of that. Um, and instead of sort of waiting, which for me could have been forever for an image to arise, if I asked a question, held a question in mind, um, was that I could ask yes, no questions. And that eventually I began to, um, to be able to ask much more specific questions yes, no questions, and um, get a strong hunch. And I would always couple it with my analytical mind. Um, eventually, I would even use it in clinical practice, and I always use both together. So it's never just intuition. Um, and so it's, I, the way I see it is very pragmatic. It's not mystical at all. Um, mm -hmm. It is just we have two eyes to see depth and breadth. We have two brains two minds really to see more clearly. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so that's really how I, how I understand it. Beautiful. All right. Since we're running out of time, I'm just going to read out some of the others. Um, so number seven is change your thoughts, change your genes. And we all know how critical that is and how hard it is to do. Uh, number eight, inhabit your body. Number nine, heal the gut. Number 10, break old habits that no longer serve you which of course, step one in that is figuring out what habits you have. Yes. Uh, number 11, practice pleasure. Number 12, investigate hidden root causes. Number 13, survive love and loss. Number 14, reclaim your purpose. Number 15, find your story, the real one. Now, for those of you 
if you found some of these interesting and, and fascinating, please buy the book so you can dive much deeper into Dr. Cynthia sharing her, her deeper insights. With that said, um, Dr. Cynthia, of the ones that are remaining, which are the one or two that you'd like to share more about because you found that they were just so instrumental in your healing? I would say uh, inhabit the body. And again, this was um, a hard uh, lesson for me. And this was the beginning of when I had um, begun Qigong. Um, but I did not realize how detached my mind was to my body. And um, that we cannot heal something that we're detached from. So I had to go into my body with its uncomfortable symptoms. So it really meant going into my fears um, and confronting them and befriending them, really, um, which was a, a huge piece. And the other piece about inhabiting the body is I just see it, again, very pragmatically as like, you know what, if you have a stroke, right, and you lose the use of your right arm, what do you do? You rehab that arm until, right, until it's useful again. And the way that I understood my body, even though it was the autonomic nervous system and it was inflamed, was that I had to learn how to rehabilitate my body and reconnect it with the mind in order for healing to happen. So that's, that's really um, that piece. The other piece that was huge for me was um, survive, love, and loss. And again, that, that's a quote that I took from uh, French um, essayist uh, Montaigne, Michel de Montaigne, and really about uh, grief and how do we release grief um, from our bodies. A lot of it is actually so, so deeply ingrained in our bodies, it's, it's subconscious. So I was carrying grief from my childhood. I was, and through, through the, um, the science of epigenetics, you know, I mean, maybe I was carrying trauma from my ancestors, um, but that's how it felt. And there was a lot of grief. I had a, a very, very um, formative loss during my medical training. My, my then partner died and I didn't have any time to, uh, to I, actually, I didn't even know how to um, handle it. And everyone just told me to just dive right back into my life and move on. So, um, and then to say nothing of the grief of having chronic illness. And uh, so I learned through rituals. Um, I also learned through Qigong that there are ways that we can release it. And it creates tremendous spaciousness that then naturally fills in with joy and hope and confidence and these characteristics that we tend to attribute to resilient people. You know, I, I could not get from despair to resilient by willing it directly. It was more about releasing stepwise. How do I release trauma? How do I release grief? Um, and then the, um, the positive uh, qualities sort of fill in as a side effect. Um, so those are, those are the two big ones. Incredible. Yeah. Dr. Cynthia, you have shared so much of your own self in this book. I really thank you. There's so much gratitude I feel for you for sharing that because it's a tough, it's tough to put down our experiences, isn't it? Yes. Um, and, and you've done it with both your arms wide open. And so I thank you. I think this is a book that anyone who suffered any kind of an autoimmune crisis or is suffering still should really pick up and read. There's so much truth and so much wisdom in it. Um, with that said, I want to thank you for taking the time out to chat with us today. Any, for any advice for someone, like what's someone who's been diagnosed with autoimmune, what do you want them to keep in mind as they begin their journey back to health? Mm -hmm. I guess I would say, because um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, disheartened people out there, right? And because through their efforts and, um, you know, not seeing sort of the um, results that they would like to see, or through other people, including doctors, giving them messages that, oh, this is something you're going to have to live with. I would just say that, um, you know, the hardest and the simplest step is the same, is to believe that it's possible, that healing is possible. And uh, belief is something that happens in the analytical mind, right? It's, so you either believe it or you don't. And it's very difficult 
to um, transcend the prognoses and the, the repeated messages. So the saving grace is that you can, you can sort of just um, default over into the intuitive or the, the right brain and just start with visualizing. Visualize yourself as fully healed and visualize yourself you know, climbing a mountain or jumping in the river or whatever it is that you want to do. And um, the healing begins then. So you, you don't even have to believe that it's possible as long as you are willing to risk trying to visualize um, what that would be like. Dr. Cynthia, again, thank you so much. You. This is an amazing book. Uh, do you have a copy of it with you? Yeah. Let's show it to everybody. There it is. Brave New Medicine. Um, pick up a copy, folks. We're going to obviously have a link uh, to it in the show notes. Keep smiling. Keep rocking. Come join me on our next episode. Check out HealCircles.org. That's the new social network for health. You can join anonymously. You can share your experiences. Do a daily challenge. Meet others like you and begin your journey back to health. Mwah. Big hugs, I'll see you soon. Dr. Cynthia, thank you again.